Indians have been living in times of transition for many years. But these are times of exceptional movement. Not only are Indians moving physically, emotionally, economically, culturally and politically, the world around them is changing. The attention is shifting to the individual. The new individual is emerging in India as the millennium changes clock. The new individuals will live in a new society, create a new economy, and participate as citizens in a new politics. Transition will fast forward their entry into a new world, at once Indian and global. As India experiences transition, the thrust of change in all senses is being felt by Indians as persons. In fact, in India, a breed of young professionals has already emerged. Confident of their special knowledge and skills, these persons have an assured sense of power. What motivates them is a high quality of life and high-voltage professional success. Like in many other countries, they are busy living out a global dream. Short on ideology, high on pragmatism, these young professionals see India as escape for enhancing their performance ratios. Madhav is an investment banker, still in his 20s, but already a first-generation multimillionaire. To my father, money was a commodity. It didn't matter whether he had it or didn't. To me, it's a necessity in the sense, I want to have certain things, so I'm driven in terms of a lot of material factors about life. it can hardly be denied that with more opportunities, India has thrown up its own share of yuppies. But today, many young professionals assert that it's simplistic to call them yuppies. It's not just a question of making money and enjoying lifestyles. Nish Khanna chooses to live in a seaside home at Juhu, away from the elite South Mumbai localities, even though he can afford it. I'm sure there are a lot of people who say that these two are just yuppies. But as far as I know, I mean, we try a lot to not to have that uh, yuppie image. Uh... For most of today's young professionals, money is only half the story told. When you get to know them, there is a burning desire to excel in a corporate culture. In fact, these highly paid, super motivated young men and women believe in only one kind of ideology, a global ideology of professionalism. The, the way it changes is the dividing lines between your personal life and your professional life. It, it gets more blurred, it gets thinner. The entrepreneurship dream and the information dream are driving the young professionals. Sanjeev Vikchandani, a professional manager, started his business in the early 90s and has grown with the liberalization boom. Today, he runs India's most popular website for careers on the internet, Nokri. Around the late 80s, you know, there was uh, this, uh, the younger professionals who wanted to switch and they were told by the older professionals, it's not a good idea to switch. I think now it's an uh, accepted fact, accepted truth that companies do not expect you to stay uh, for 20, 25, 30 years. They have mostly given up that dream. Uh, if they can get you to stay for five years or 10 years or the guy who's staying for five years, if he can be made to stay for seven years or eight years, that's a good achievement. It's interesting how some of these young professionals are making a complex transition from the personalized values of a traditional society to the norms of a new society. Many young persons have to face the contradiction between a culture at home which is essentially warm, human, peaceful and often spiritual and a 
work culture of professionalism, which demands impersonal objectivity and aggression. The moment I'm home, I, I have a different kind of a life. I'm more social and, you know, all those cult cultural things are to be taken care of. But uh, when I'm in the office, it's totally different. Like, I have to look after people. Basically, I feel that uh, it's apart from everything, most important thing is the karma. That is what I believe in. <laughs> the celebrated management guru, Peter Drucker, thinks that knowledge workers will dominate today's age of information. In India, the young professionals who are most influential today are clearly knowledge workers. Like in the rest of the world, the workplace is seeing a transition in work culture. The new knowledge workers are earning the maximum and clearly enjoying real power. They mark the arrival of the individual as the fulcrum of change at the end of the millennium. Children, especially those from affluent families, are being trained early to participate in a technocratic world ruled by computers, even if they often can't quite figure out what this is all about. Very good. Training in real social skills is sometimes given less importance. In an expanding culture of consumption, even children are being oriented to become good consumers. Often the imagination of children is being colored by images of commodities. The desire and dream to consume is starting early. In fact, some are worrying a bit too early. influential consumption culture is working its way into the contemporary Indian consciousness. The supermarket dream is the most flashy and fashionable. It's caught the imagination of India's 200 million strong middle class. As individualism grows, the desire for material well-being seems to be growing simultaneously. The shopping mall is the new habitat of status and prosperity in city and town. Consumerism is not economics. It is culture, it is psychology, it is also even an ideology. People consume not because they have to purchase something, they consume also because they have to consume. It is a perfect cure for loneliness and isolation and it also gives meaning to an otherwise meaningless life. The supermarket dream is creating a virtual community of consumers, transcending caste, greed, religion and language. The ultimate dream that Indians are busy dreaming today is the dream of consumption. Today, the ultimate fantasy is glamour a ubiquitous but ephemeral something called glamour. It can be bought and importantly sold. The most brilliant product, glamour. The glamour myth is touching everything, the mind, body and even imagination. But make no mistake, the glamour myth isn't something trivial or to be taken lightly. It's at the centre of a lot of the transition taking place in India today. Maybe I'm wrong, but glamour is all this jet setting, you know, going to one place one day and meeting whatever CEOs of big companies like Apple and IBM and all that. And uh, yeah, having your own cell phone and two or three credit cards and things like that. So guys and gals, 
Individual aspirations and lifestyles are dictated by the glamour myth. While it provides the necessary razzmatazz to an obsessive economy generating success and stress in equal measure, the crisis happens when its larger-than-life hype is seen as reality by many. This generates contradictions and puts pressures on traditional norms and values. What really matters to me are my products and my generation. Corporate tycoons like Vijay Malia personally participate in the creation of glamour China as part of their corporate strategy. Discarding the usual business-like attire and formal talk, here Malia can be seen joining television VJs, speaking and behaving like his targeted customers, campus youth and young professionals. This is clearly a highly professionalized ritual in building up youth lifestyles. It's projecting a way of life centered on glamour and consumption. UB will create a lifestyle of its own followers. But the glamour myth is not only touching youth, it's changing lives, not to speak of parties. Today, events are being created out of even traditional Indian weddings. Wedding has become an event today. Basically, every uh, family, you know, every household, you know, I'm talking about, you know, basically the rich people who, you know, have that kind of money, who want to, you know, basically show that kind of glamour. What kind of money goes into a wedding, typically? Uh, 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 it depends, right from, you can say from, you know, see, it's talking about all the five functions and everything, you know. It, it ranges from about two and a half crores to maybe five crores. It depends, you know, how much the client wants to spend. In typical Indian contradiction, a contemporary experience of glamour is being superimposed, almost, on age-old traditions and even religious rituals. But under the sheath of glamour, personal lives are changing in deeper ways. The tone and tenor of all personal relationships is changing. The modern apartment has a veneer of efficiency and well-being, even glamour for those who can afford it. But it's also an icon of personal space and freedom, central themes in today's global culture. Indian families are in transition. In many cases, architecture and the physical pressures of urban living are redefining the family. The modern apartment is designed for the nuclear family. Its limited space has an inherent logic which works against large joint families. New solutions in organizing the family are appearing in a changing world. But one can't just say joint families are disappearing, nor simply conclude that nuclear families are necessarily the new norm. Some young couples are living in separate apartments, but are still happy to be near their parents' home. Family ties are maintained, but personal space respected. Personal space is a function of physical space as well. Like you uh, get the feeling of, uh, you know, being constricted and limited if you really don't have physical space. But this wasn't always the situation. The huge houses that large families demand were earlier available like this mansion, which was once home to Calcutta's aristocracy. Shakuntala Ghosh, a top city architect, belongs to the family which owns this house. As the joint family broke up into nuclear units, the house itself began to be literally broken down. Today, nobody from the family lives here. Half of it is demolished, and in its place stands a crude, commercially built building, which defies aesthetics.
to many years when she came to visit this house with our film crew, Shakuntala couldn't speak for a while. Maybe because of nostalgia or a sense of professional shock. Times have to change. Maybe in this entire big building there was maybe a family of four or five and where it could can accommodate much more. The pressure on the land is there, but it must be done in a harmonious manner. In Delhi's Chandni Chowk area, old houses called Havelis exist. But even here, traditional families are changing their ways of living. The new generation is beginning to find family trappings worrisome as it increasingly gets exposed to ideas of individualism. The old guard swears by tradition. The interface is providing an opportunity for change. Shaheed Zafar Khan, the grandson of the famous freedom fighter Hakim Ajmal Khan, belongs to a family which has practiced traditional medicine for 12 generations. Shaheed is the first to give it up and take up business, but still prefers to have his hand firmly on tradition. Families are learning to live in two worlds. We were talking about our father's time, that he told us that before he was a joint family, people were talking about a little bit. If there was a little bit of a little bit, they were talking about it. For example, the gate of our Haveli, the door, तो उससे बाहर किसी को ये इजाजत नहीं थी कि वो बगैर टोपी के बाजार में आ जाए। My parents are very open. Even my nani, she's the oldest in her house. She's very modern, liberal. She wants me to study. You know, she wants me to be. Actually, she wanted me to become a doctor, but I couldn't become. But now, even she wants me to go for IAS or go for lectureship. So that's good. She's supporting me in some extent. Sometimes my nani supports me more than my mom or dad. So you know, that's good. Arpana Kaur is one of the most accomplished Indian artists. Her creative concern has been the duality between tradition and modernity, which is defining Indian transition. This has produced a special brand of Indian multiculturalism. We seem to exist in the past and present at the same time in this country, which makes it very rich, very complex, very interesting. And I have been using, as in this work, you know, with the wall of old fort and this woman embroidering, uh, and this uh, inverted monarch juxtaposed with all this traffic graffiti, again, of the city. So it's the two times uh, in this kind of work. Having a good time, come on, let's hand in the air. Everybody hands in the air. Come to enjoy yourself. Hands in Multiculturalism the air. happens in visible physical settings in India, producing tensions as well as creative energy. It's different from contemporary multicultural societies in the West. For one, India has had a longer history of communities and cultures intermixing and living together than most societies. The difference today is that communities and groups which were earlier in harmony are today competing for resources and opportunities. Tensions and anger happen, but Indians have also learnt to love, romance and prosper in new situations. Multiculturalism isn't affecting only the collective psyche. Even at the individual level, multiculturalism has produced a post-colonial generation of cultural hybrids in India. The new cultural hybrids are distinct in spirit and style. They live in the cities, often speaking more than one language. Their culture is an imaginative mixture of the atmosphere in their homes and the outside world of the city in which they grew up. It has 
हो जाए कल हम मैसेज करेंगे Pinaz Masani is a cultural hybrid in more senses than one. She grew up in a Parsi home devoted to Western classical music, but she went on to become one of India's most popular singers of the traditional ghazal in the 80s. Today, Pinaz finds that she has to change her music as popular trends enter. She has to work in the pop genre of hybrid music labeled as indie pop. Places like Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, Bangalore. I know I'll be doing pop shows. I've got invitations to do pop shows there because there's so much of the influence. It's not here. There's so much of influence of uh, the, the 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 big city, the, the city culture. Where people go to college, the, the kids go to colleges. They, they hear a lot of Michael Jackson. They ape a lot of Maria Carey. They, they read a lot of uh, novels. They, you know, there's still so much of uh, there's a lot of mixing of the Western culture in big cities rather than small cities. Not only music, even something as intrinsic as human beauty is up for cultural change. Personal beauty and charisma are being considered critical in a culture which swears by individualism. Many young women all over India seem to be in the throes of what the American feminist author Naomi Wolf has called the beauty myth. The new beauty, both as idea and reality, took root, with 18-year-old Sushmita Sen winning the Miss Universe title. and Aishwarya Rai, a student of architecture, winning the Miss World title, both in 1994. We all have seen over the last few years, the woman of the 90s is very different from what you saw of the woman of the 70s and the 80s. The, uh, the concept of beauty has changed because now the woman definitely de wants to look good as she always did, that's her prerogative, but she wants to more than that look confident. You know, the women are working today. They have the disposable incomes. They want to feel confident. And the attitudes have changed over the past, uh, say, 10 to 12 years. The traditional beauty had a soft, fuzzy, spiritual, almost sacred air about it. Women glowed in it. Sensuous at most, but never aggressively sexual. The new beauty is defined, specific, material, and unabashedly physical. The body is celebrated for its own sake in all its physicality. The spirit has taken a back seat. is also creating the new romance. The transition in values seems almost across the board. The new romance hides beneath its surface the sexuality myth. The media has been busy talking about the great Indian sexual revolution. How much of this is true and how much media hype is yet to be seriously determined. What's certain is that it's changing concepts of romance. Attitude of people have changed. Now it is like uh, people are more on the, um, you know, they're on, they're they're more on 
uh, whatever you said, aggressive, that is, uh, that is a very extreme term, but I don't want to go into that. It is, uh, they, they have become more practical in the, in the romance, which is more on the utopian side, it has now become more practical. The new romance is being noticed for its transience. The traditional Indian ideal of the desirability of an almost eternal commitment in romance is under scrutiny. The youth often considers lifelong commitment odd, if not impossible. While many are enjoying the flexibility to make and break romance in a world of hire and fire policies, many are not so sure that they like the flux and fluidity in romance. But as individualism grows, relationships are bound to search for new social and psychological formats. It's that, that concept yeah, of a guy meeting girl and running around trees is gone a long time ago. So but what is the now, concept now? And right now it's just, it's basically it's just, having fun. It's just having fun, together. spending time with someone who's a little more, like, like together. yeah, like you do, you do uh, things like, getting like, wet in the rain. Yeah. It's just, it's just spending getting time with someone, buddy. can I finish? No, you may not. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's just spending time with someone a bit more special to you than the rest of your friends. It's not the romance part yeah, of it. It's, it's getting physical with it's the normal part of it. Maybe it's an achievement thing. I have a girlfriend and it's an accomplishment and an achievement that I have a girlfriend. As the millennium ends, the greatest transition is happening on the campus. Students are busy redefining the new Indian campus, both at the level of values and aspirations. In the individual sweepstakes, personal ambition is pushing back any talk of abstract social commitment. I think I see myself as an Indian aspiring to be a global citizen. Yeah. And I trying to broaden my entire horizon by going to the States and having an absolutely international outlook towards everything, whether it's me as an individual or whether it's academics or career or anything. It's a college environment that's changing, I feel. The aim of going to college was to sit, study, stuff like that. Now it's more like going to college, enjoy yourself, have fun, and but maybe do a time. bit of study. I mean, like, India's a home, but... India's a home, India but... Is a home, so but India is good if you have money in it. If there's no money, there's no life. I think it's better when you go abroad and make money and then come back here. No, but does that mean you can't make money here? The road ahead to the emergence of a new society is difficult but possible. The success or failure to improve the quality of life in a real sense for a large mass of Indians as individuals will be the determinant of whether development in India can transcend technocratic progress and touch human welfare. The entrepreneurship dream, the technology dream, the global dream are all collaborating to create the Indian dream at the end of the millennium. India is busy creating a vision for 2000 AD and beyond. A vision driven by both enthusiasm and some inherent strengths of the economy. Indians are busy connecting to a global dream of freedom, success and quality of life.